Yo, what is up guys? It's me, Zach Lee, and welcome to day 47 of the 2017-2018 NBA season. We got a lot to recap today, so let's just get right into it. But first, a quick word from this video sponsor, SeatGeek. SeatGeek is the app that is a must-have for NBA fans who enjoy or want to go see games live. They let you see the view from the seat before you purchase, as well as rank the seats on a scale from 1 to 100 to make sure that you are getting the absolute best deal. Speaking of best deal, you can enter the promo code SDC to receive $20 off your first order to make it an even better deal. Download the app in the description box below. But now with that out of the way, Lego. A subscriber in the comment section yesterday pointed out that if the Cavs won this game, they would have like an 11 game winning streak. And the Grizzlies would have had an 11 game losing streak. And if the Grizzlies won, then both the longest streaks for winning and losing would be snapped at the same time. And in the third quarter, it seemed like it was going to be an easy win for the Cavs, up by 19 midway through the period but then memphis went on a bit of a rally to tie the game up with about two minutes to go in the fourth quarter then lebron james took over to score seven points in the final minute and a half to ice the game for cleveland they get the win 116 to 111 to extend their winning streak to 11 and extend the Grizzlies losing streak to 11 as well. And James continues his incredible play with 34 points and 12 assists while Evans and Gasol did the best they could for Memphis, especially Evans. He has been amazing this year. 31 points, 12 assists, and 7 rebounds. An absolute steal for the Memphis Grizzlies. Anyways though, on to the real news about the Cavs from yesterday. I just had to cover the game real quick because we're on the top of Cleveland and why not get it out the way. But Derrick Rose is coming back, according to reports. He has let the Cavs know that he wants to come back and rejoin the team after about maybe a week or two ago when he said he wanted to take some time away from the team to see if he even wanted to still play basketball. But I hate to say I told you so, but I told you so. I told you guys that there was no way Derrick Rose was going to walk away from what was his best shot that he was Will ever have to win a championship. If there was any shred of love or care for him about the game left in him, then he would be back. And I will also say it again, I wouldn't put money on the Cavs to win a championship this year, and I'm not predicting the Cavs to win a championship this year, but a couple of years ago, when I said I had a gut feeling the Cavs were going to win, even though the Warriors were in the midst of the best regular season in NBA history, the Cavs won. And I got the same gut feeling right now. This just has the perfect plot to it if you think about it. Cavs get demolished in the finals by the Golden State Warriors. LeBron James then recruits his best friend in Dwayne Wade. Kyrie Irving asks to be traded, gets traded for Isaiah Thomas. Derrick Rose joins with the team, leaves the team because he gets injured again, and then comes back. Plenty of questions about LeBron's future in Cleveland after this year, and most fans expecting the Golden State Warriors to win the next two, if not three, championships. All of this stuff happens, all of these circumstances, and the Cavs still somehow manage to win a championship. It's just like all the drama that you would expect to happen in an NBA season. And like I said, I ain't gonna come on and say that I am predicting the Cleveland Cavaliers to win the 2018 NBA championship, but I got the same feeling that I did back in 2016. So. I wouldn't necessarily be surprised if they somehow did win. I thought the Denver Nuggets were going to be in a lot of trouble this game. They will be without Nikola Jokic, and then for the Lakers, they were getting Kyle Kuzma back. I thought the Lakers were going to get this win for sure until they didn't, mainly because in the fourth quarter, the Nuggets played outside of their minds. You have Will Barton hitting just about every shot he took. He scored like 13 points in the final six or seven minutes of the game. And then in the last half of the last quarter, the Nuggets also didn't let the Lakers score much at all. Only two points in the final six minutes for LA. I don't know if it was Denver's defense or LA just messing up and couldn't make a shot and kept turning the ball over unforcedly because Denver hasn't been known as a good defensive team. Luke Walton said that the damage done to the Lakers was self-inflicted down the stretch and the good thing about it being self-inflicted is that they can stop inflicting it to themselves in the future. I dig his positivity, but sometimes he seems like one of those people that can come off as just too positive. Sometimes there is a need to come out and say that we play like trash down the stretch you don't always have to be like yeah we lost but that's okay because each loss we take puts us that much closer to our next victory like what tell that to memphis or chicago the interesting part of this game though came in the final seconds when the game was already pretty much over jamal murray dribbles the ball up the court 
kind of goes around Lonzo Ball, I guess. And then Julius Randle doesn't like it, so he follows Murray and has some words for him. Jamal Murray just brushes it off, though, and walks away. Of course, Lakers fan absolutely went in on Jamal Murray for dribbling around Lonzo like this. They wanted to back up their point guard. I personally don't see that big of a deal, but maybe that's because I'm not a Lakers fan. But I just want to say that I do like that the Lakers actually stood up for Lonzo Ball. Julius Randle going to confront Jamal Murray about it. I like that. I mean, you shouldn't just sit back and watch your teammate get disrespected. Even if Lonzo did kind of just walk away from his teammates, back in that Phoenix game, but hey, I guess that's water under the bridge now. Joel Embiid vs. Andre Drummond round two, or round one since Embiid called out Drummond's defense. And even before the game, there was a bit of trash talking between these two bigs. Embiid saying no disrespect, but Andre Drummond can't shoot. And then Drummond saying that Embiid can't even talk to him until he's allowed to play back to backs. I had a feeling this was going to be a really good game, and it, and it was. Embiid was trying to go at Drummond a lot last night, I noticed, and Drummond was trying to prove to Embiid that he was wrong about him as a defender. And I'd say Drummond did a pretty good job at it too. I know some people will look at the box score and see that Embiid put up 25 points, but if you watch the game, when he was being defended by Drummond, Embiid was finding it pretty difficult to score. 7 of 21 shooting from the field, most of those points that he had came at the free throw line. And speaking of which, late in the fourth quarter, Embiid had the ball in the post against Drummond, turns, makes a drive to the basket, and falls to the Ground, Drummond gets called for his sixth foul, and Embiid tells him to go to the bench. Now, the call itself was pretty questionable. People say that Drummond hip checked Embiid, and I do see some contact there, but that wouldn't even have been called a foul if Embiid didn't hit the deck, and I don't think that was enough contact to make Embiid hit the deck like he did, but he sold the foul. That's what you gotta do. It's just part of the game, and as a Pistons fan, I wanted to be upset for it happening, but then I realized that I would have wanted Drummond to have done the same thing if he was in Embiid's situation. It's a smart play, and just doing whatever it takes to get your team to win. Because after that, the Sixers got the momentum they needed to escape with the win after nearly blowing like a 16 or 17 point lead. And after the game, the two of them showed that they are more friends than enemies. And B did say that he told his teammates that he was going to make Drummond foul out in this game. But all the talking stuff is just for fun. Definitely, uh, I think the next ball, I wanted it. Uh, and then he ended up following me and following out. That was the goal going out uh, before this game. I told my teammates that he was going to fall out, uh, and he did, but, you know, it's all fun. Uh, at the end of the game, we hugged it out. Uh, it's all fun. We just having fun out there. You know, I love having fun on social media. Uh, he does, too. So, you know, we just, we're just young kids. Out and then Andre Drummond said that he enjoys going up against other great big men like Joel Embiid. I played him the same way I played the whole second half. I got up into him and uh, tried to make it tough for him. Obviously, he sold the move better than I played defense. So <laughs> uh, he got the sixth foul, and you know they won the game. It's as simple as that. A conversation about the banner that went back and forth, but is it mostly good nature? There's no hard feelings between. Uh, it's them. never hard feeling. It's, I mean, when was the last time we seen two? real big man. go at it so uh it's just with a great matchup you know i look forward to playing them again obviously um a little player this is what you would call a healthy rivalry i mean the guys go at each other but it's never like you think a huge fight is about to break out it's just two guys going at each other that want to win and it adds a lot more excitement to the games when it's like this what is there to say about this look of course the boston celtics won this one even if it was only by five points 116 to 111 but to be honest i kind of lost all respect for the phoenix suns team after i saw this defensive sequence smart wide open Comes back to him. Wide open. Horford will try. It was just Marcus Smart. No need to defend him because he's one of the worst shooters in the league has ever seen. Look, leaving Smart open the first time was understandable. You had a meltdown defensively. You left him open. Sure, whatever. He ain't gonna make it. Ball bounces back. No one else even tries to get the rebound. And they all just sit there and watch him take the shot again. Well, I wouldn't do that, but still, it bounced off the rim. He missed. And at least after that happened, Marquise Chris made somewhat of an attempt to get the rebound but after it hit the after it literally bounced off the court once everyone on the suns just watched it they just watched the ball in comes al horford out of nowhere runs picks up the ball takes his time backs up to the three-point line suns players still watching 
and he drains it. Never in my life have I seen such a non-caring disgraceful effort on the defensive end. Bucks almost let an early 20 point lead of the Kings slip away. Milwaukee kind of like they did in the last game I believe started off the game great. Lots of energy, ball moving on offense and playing great defense but then they got kind of lax about things. I think they expected Sacramento just to give up and stop trying. And that's a bad habit that sometimes the younger and experienced teams like this have. But regardless of all that, the Bucks held on to get the 109 to 104 win behind Giannis Antetokounmpo and his 33 points, 13 rebounds, and five assists. If not for an unfortunate series of events, the Pelicans might actually be a few games over 500 right now. They had to go without AD yesterday as he will be out for a while with the pelvis injury that they are now saying. But yesterday's win over the Blazers should provide some hope for Pelicans fans out there that the team might be able to hold on without him. Rajon Rondo had his best game of the season so far with 12 points, 10 assists, and six rebounds, and Drew Holiday, I've noticed he has been playing a bit better recently too, but Cousins is going to have to be the guy for this team with AD down, and he did a good job of being the guy last night with 38 points and 8 rebounds. The Clippers are now 0-1 since Austin Rivers went out of fan. He tried to have the Kyrie Irving effect, but not even that can save LA right now as they just suffered maybe their worst loss of the season, the form of a 26 point blow loss to the Dallas Mavericks, 108-82. To 82. JJ Barea was the man for Dallas last night as he had 21 points and 10 assists and 24 minutes on the bench. Dennis Schroeder is a really freaking good player. He had 24 points and Luke Babbitt, of all people, was on fire yesterday. He had 21 off the bench and the two of them proved to be too much for the Nets to handle as they fall 114 to 102 to the Atlanta Hawks. But there is all the action from last night that you guys go vote for the player of the day by going to the community section of my channel and voting on the poll. I'm going to be trying this now. I think you guys are going to like this voting system a bit more. But still, only players whose team won are eligible to win player of the day. And yesterday, you guys selected Donovan Mitchell and his career high 41 points as your player of the day. But thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure to leave a like on this video as well as subscribe to the channel for more daily NBA news and highlights. But until tomorrow, keep getting the buckets to my SDC, and I'm out of here. Peace!